folks tuning in from home, we were having some technical difficulties, but I think we're back, back on. The Holy Gospel according to Mark 10, Mark 10, 46 to 52. They came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. With the word of God in scripture, with the word of God among us, with the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. If you're considering a trip or traveling somewhere, it's pretty normal to plan it all out. The itinerary, the lodging, the train or airfare, having it all in hand. We like to know our way. It doesn't hurt to have a map or a plan. And often we like to know the whole, how the whole trip will play out before we even begin the journey. I've tried it the other way, and I don't know that it's recommended. <laughs> You have four kids, and you're like, is there somewhere we're going to sleep tonight? <laughs> but that can often be said of our lives in general as well. We want to know where we're going. We want to know how we're going to pay for something, or where we're going to work, or who we're going to enter into a relationship with, or where we're going to live, or how we're going to retire, and I guess we might as well script the funeral while we're at it. <laughs> it's tempting to know it all ahead of time. To not take a step until we know how it's going to turn out. But what would it be like, I wonder, to step into the unknown? Into the darkness, into a place that isn't on the map. In our text today, we hear the story of a blind man, someone who literally could not see and yet takes a step forward anyway. Our story picks up with Jesus and the disciples themselves on a journey. They're en route to Jerusalem on the pilgrimage way heading to the holy city of the holy city of Jerusalem for Passover. And Jericho is the last major stop on the pilgrimage route. This meant the number of pilgrims would be expanding. The path would be full of folks walking step after step. They didn't need a map, just follow the crowd. And my own experience in walking uh, pilgrimage on the Camino this past summer confirms this experience. The closer you get to your destination, the more people are along the way with you. More folks taking one step at a time. More folks wondering, are we there yet? And sensing, yeah, we're almost there. And the text confirms this setting. It says they came to Jericho, and then, as Jesus and his disciples in a large crowd were leaving Jericho, so quick stop, because they have somewhere to go. About to hit the final leg of their pilgrimage, next stop, Jerusalem. They can already anticipate resting their feet, celebrating the festival, and no doubt finding some good food. And then it says, as they were leaving Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting by the roadside. Probably not unusual. Not an unusual spot, that is. No doubt there were a number of such folks, knowing that pilgrims might well be in the mood to offer a few coins. But this beggar wasn't content with just a few coins. He'd heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth passing through, and so he starts to shout. Well, the mood of this crowd of pilgrims suddenly shifts. Coins may be put back in pockets. Hush, keep it down. Don't you know that beggars are meant to be seen and not heard? 
and actually preferably not even seen. But he is not to be deterred. The text says the crowd ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. Well, Jesus, Jesus notices the commotion, and it says Jesus stood still. Jesus stood still. I like to think of this as reflecting an inner posture of calm, not just stopping physically, but a presence amidst this chaotic scene. Jesus perfectly centered, perfectly present. Instead of dismissing him or agreeing with the crowd to silence him, Jesus in the stillness says, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And it says, throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. That cloak might have been the only thing he owned. And in a way, the gospel writer is setting up some contrasts for us. If we go back a short time earlier, you'll remember in the Gospel of Mark, who ran up to Jesus? A wealthy young man, one who possessed many properties, probably also was in full health. And here we have someone poor, someone not in full health, who cannot see, who's been reduced to begging, and he, too, runs to Jesus. And then he says, or, and then Jesus says to him what he had said to the disciples, James and John. Again, just earlier in our text, remember the brothers who came up to Jesus said, and asked for positions of prominence, right? Have us sit at your right and in your left, teacher. But before that, what did Jesus say to them? What is it you want me to do for you? He says that same thing to this person in this moment. What do you want me to do for you? These brothers wanted glory. They wanted power. They wanted to be important. And as Jesus takes the time to actually ask this person, this invisible person, what do you want me to do for you? The crowd hanging on every word. How will this end? No one ever gives a person like this much attention. The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. He asked not for wealth, not for power, not for prestige. He asked for healing, for sight, to be able to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regains his sight and follows him on the way. Notice Jesus didn't ask this person to follow him like he did the young man. But he does so anyway. Jesus did ask the young man to follow him and he walked away sad. The difference? One valued possessions property, material, success. Those provided security, a roadmap so that he knew where he would be going, where he would sleep, how things would turn out. Jesus offered him the chance to be a disciple, to walk on a road of uncertainty, a road of faith, a road you can only make by walking. And of course, the class Contrast, perhaps implied, is actually pretty explicit. One is poor, one is rich. The rich man does not follow Jesus, and how hard it is, Jesus says, for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are worried and say, who then can be saved? And Jesus knows that all things are possible with God, and so Jesus is not writing off the wealthy man by any means, simply noting that the harder we try to hold on to things, and the more we try to hold on to things, the harder it is to say yes to following Jesus. So on the one hand, we have this wealthy man. On the other, this blind beggar, whose name is Bartimaeus, which some say translates to son of the unclean. Son of the unclean. His very name seemed to limit his destiny. Mark out a path 
And even the crowd tries to silence him when he dares to try to use his own voice. And too often we find ourselves, frankly, as part of this crowd, hushing the more problematic folks who, frankly, take extra to deal with. Marlon Viss shared a story from a recent uh, Wednesday night at Refresh. He said, last night at Refresh, a project that provides services for unhoused people as well as those with food insufficiencies, with no ac access to showers, etc. He said, last night, one of our guests slash friends had a meltdown. There was a lot of yelling, swearing, and it was unsettling for the entire room. The person was asked to leave and did. Marlon says, I moved over to the dishwashing center and said to the volunteer, that person is their own worst enemy. And he says, standing next to me, unnoticed by me, was another of our guests slash friends. This person overheard my comment and said, we are all our own worst enemy when we are going through shit. <clears throat> he says, once again, I was humbled and then reminded about how much we have to learn from those living on the margins. Our text today reminds us that those on the margins are often closest to the kingdom of God. They often have insights, the ability to see things the rest of us miss. And so what does it mean for us to learn to see? What does it mean for us to be healed from our own blindness? The current social and political climate, you might say, is steeped in darkness. Scapegoating those already marginalized is baptized as a winning strategy. So far, nearly $70 million has been spent on anti-trans ads in 10 Senate races in nine House districts. $20 million was spent on just one anti-trans ad in the presidential race. And how much was spent on, I don't know, something you think you talk about, like the economy? Yeah. Only $5 million. I say only, but wow. comparatively. And $243.6 million was spent in just the third quarter, meaning in a three-month stretch, to fund anti-immigrant television ads in battleground states, including ours. These ads meant to vilify and demonize folks who are simply trying to find a better life for their family, folks our economy depends on, Folks created in the image of God, these ads were viewed over 6.5 billion times. What does that repeated belittling do to our national psyche? What long-term harm is happening to our collective national soul, let alone literal harm to these people? At a rally just a few days ago, a presidential nominee compared immigrants to trash, saying that the United States has become a garbage can for the world because of, quote-unquote, illegal border crossings. Millions of Christians see those ads and hear this rhetoric telling lies about our immigrant neighbors and don't bat an eye. Often they nod their heads and cheer. <clears throat> Millions of Christians will vote for candidates who paid for and endorsed these ads and who use such rhetoric. When a candidate for President of the United States can stand up and call immigrants vermin who are poisoning the blood of our country and not be asked to step down or suspend their campaign and in fact sees a, a bump in the polling because of it, then we have truly lost our way. You wonder if this story would hit home if 
Bartimaeus was an unhoused, undocumented, transgender Samaritan beggar who is healed by Jesus and becomes a model for what it means to be a disciple. But I kind of doubt it. Probably the crowds would still shout him down and silence his voice. Easy, though, to point fingers and feel good about myself. But where would I be in this crowd? Where am I today? Who are the marginalized in our community that I too frequently pass by or don't even see? Back in World War II, German pastor Martin Niemöller wrote words to this effect. First they came for the communists. I stood silently by. I never was a communist. What did it matter to me? Then they came for the union men and I stood silently by. I never was a union man. What did it matter to me? And when they came for immigrants in the Jewish community, I just closed my eyes. I wasn't an immigrant and I wasn't a Jew, so I stood silently by. What did it matter? How could it matter? Why should it matter to me? Cry out, cry out, it's still going on today. Your neighbor is an immigrant, they're coming to take her away. And now I hear they're coming soon, they're coming soon for me, there's no one left who might cry out, cry out to set me free. No one of us is truly safe until we all are free. No one of us can truly say it matters not to me. Cry out, cry out, it's still going on today. Where is your next door neighbor? Why have they gone away? A rabbi once asked his students, how can we determine the hour of dawn when the night ends and the day truly begins? One student replied, when there is enough light so I can distinguish between a dog and a sheep? No, the rabbi responds. Another said, when I can tell a goat from a donkey? The rabbi shook his head. When I can distinguish between a fig tree and a grapevine? No, answered the rabbi yet again. Well, then what is the answer? Tell us. He said, you know, you will know it is dawn and the light has come when you can look into the face of every human being and see your mother, your sister, your brother. May we be healed from our own blindness. May the dawn come quickly and may God have mercy on us. Amen. Maybe so. <laughs>
participate in that. We'll pass these baskets in a moment. You can also give online via the Giveify app, going to hollanducc.org. And as always, it is out of God's generosity that we give, asking that God would use these gifts and us to turn our world upside down with love. Thank you. 
traditions this morning. Beautiful. We have some time now, friends, to share some things happening with us that we'd like to lift up in prayer or perhaps celebrate together. So if you have something, feel free to raise your hand. I'll come out of the mic. And friends tuning in from home, feel free to post in the comments, and we'll do our best to share that as well. I'm very grateful that I have a birthday on Halloween, and I'm going to make it into 86. <laughs> I'm heart sick and I just wept. We shall overcome because of what is happening to our country. We need to be on our knees praying to save us. Thank you, Jean. And early happy birthday to you and to celebrate uh, that for Jean. So for Jean's uh, 86th trip around the sun, we say thanks be to God. Hallelujah. And of course, hearing your words. We lift up our nation and say, oh God, we are our prayers. <clears throat> Quick update on my sister. Um, she did have successful knee replacement surgery, but she's two days in for a longer stay because of the heart issue. So hopefully coming home today. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you for that update. Uh, Appreciate that so much. We'll keep Christy in our prayers and her recovery and pray that her uh, mobility returns quickly and that me and heart are well. So for Christy, we say, oh God, hear our prayers. Yep, I see one back. Thank you. Hi, this is my friend and neighbor Kay, and we witnessed our other dear friend and neighbor Anne go to the hospital today via ambulance for the second time since Thursday evening. She suffered a minor stroke on Thursday, came home on Friday, and her daughter just called me during the service to say she has a blood clot in her head. So we hope you pray for Ann Mings. She's a grand lady. We love her a lot, and um, she's special to so many, and we just want the best for her. So please pray with us. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Okay, thinking of your friend Anne and pray for healing for her. So for Anne, we say, oh God. Okay. I got uh, good news and bad news. So uh, last weekend, I um, ran my first marathon. <laughs> I'm very happy about because like a couple months ago, I had COVID and pneumonia, so I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to run, but I ended up doing it and completed it, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and then my other news, uh, yesterday was my grandmother's funeral service. Uh, she was 94. Um, she's a Polish immigrant who um, was basically forced out of Poland due to World War II. Mm -hmm. and eventually made her way to America and lived the American dream. So I'm mm -hmm. um, very sad to lose her, but um, she's a great example of um, an immigrant coming here. and um, She taught me so much, and especially now with the political environment. She, um, I hope that she helps me bring the strength to kind of get through this, so. Thank you, Joe. A great reminder that those of us who are not immigrants ourselves often don't have to look that far back in our own families uh, right, to see the immigrant story. So thank you for sharing that. Thinking of your family in this time of loss. So thinking of Joe and family as they said farewell to their grandmother. Lift them up to God. Say, oh God. And for running your first marathon, <laughs> we celebrate that. Say thanks be to God. Hallelujah. A good friend and clergy colleague of mine, and Anna Ruth Fitzgerald, Lynn Squire, has passed away very unexpectedly this week. Colleen. Colleen Squire, I said. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Colleen, <laughs> thinking about her, uh, her wife, Linda. Um, she was pastor of All Souls uh, in the Church in Grand Rapids, a church I pastored a lot of 
kind of programming with them. It's just a huge loss for the community um, and certainly for, for all souls. So yeah. hold up um, that's coming squires and all souls and the Okay, yeah, thank you for that uh, thinking of this community and this time of loss, thinking of our siblings and all souls, thinking of Linda and losing just beloved spouse Colleen. And so gratitude for Colleen's life and ministry and prayers for all those in grief at this time. So that one say, oh God. Yes. Let's call this a hallelujah. Our, our son, um, getting on to be about 40, um, uh, served four years in the Marine Corps in the early 2000s. And um, I mean, I can't describe to you how intensive um, that kid um, time in the Marine Corps was. But um, anyway, he has a familial heart issue passed on by Jude's mom's family and Jeff's dad's family down. It's um, uh, my office. You were quick to not take credit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and probably exacerbated by really um, over the top conditions as a young man. But he had a defibrillator put in this, this week. And that should allow him, even though he's a young man, that should allow him to more fully um, move around and be active and the like. So, um, uh, thanks for a successful procedure for Benjamin. Absolutely. Thank you for that update, Greg. Gratitude to hear that that went well for Benjamin. We'll pray that this will provide him the full health, heart health uh, going forward. So, for that, we celebrate. So thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Other things going on that we can hold space for. <clears throat> weeks, I think. There's been a large number of folks hanging out in Centennial Park. Many of them are folks who come to refresh. So two parts of this, uh, I guess two parts to mention. One is hard to imagine what it would be like each day to try and figure out where you're going to spend the day, particularly as the weather is turns. Um, and secondly, I guess following today's sermon, may I often encounter those folks who are hanging out in large numbers in Centennial Park, may everyone who encounters them see them as their siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Amy. Uh, thinking of so many folks in our community here in Holland who don't have housing, who don't have a place to lay their head, a place to wake up and make breakfast, maybe not even breakfast. Holding space for them, gratitude for many who seek to come alongside, but may more of us come alongside to bless these folks and to look at the systems and the gaps that allows for us to live this way together. So for those folks, we say, oh God. Having grown up on Otto Beach, I struggle with a lot of um, screen cell cancers, and um, I've had radiation a few times. But Tuesday, I have some surgery on my chest, which I'm concerned about, and I appreciate your prayers. And aren't we grateful that, that we're all immigrants? I mean, and that our parents thought to come to this country but people don't see that, you know. What it says on the front of the bulletin is so true. The Native Americans were here far before, and we never should celebrate Columbus Day. Thank you, Kay. We'll be thinking of you this week for your procedure. Pray that all go well. Pray for that ceiling. So for Kay, we say, oh God, pray our prayers. I get the privilege of sharing that Kim Gunn's daughter, Sarah, had her baby boy. Um, she had to move past some complications, but all is now well. They will come home today. Awesome. Well, so glad to hear that. Uh, congratulations, Kim, on the birth of this 
uh, grandbaby and pray for health for your daughter and this uh, young one. So for Kim Gunn and family, we celebrate and say thanks to you, God. Hallelujah. <laughs> tied to two things that people have already mentioned together, but uh, a praise is my daughter adopted a dog this week, but it came from, she's in North Carolina, and the dog to rescue from Western North Carolina and the floods that hit there. And then this week, um, we've had the opportunity to canvas areas of Holland uh, for Kamala Harris, and ran into somebody who was sure that that storm was geoengineered. And uh, we had a long conversation, which I don't think I made any progress in, but the disinformation that's out there uh, is, is terrible and hard to overcome, and we can have more truth <laughs> be spoken. And thanks for speaking truth today. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff, for being out there for that encounter and doing what you can celebrate the adoption of the dog uh, in the family. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a part of the family. And so we celebrate that and we do pray for truth, true information, wisdom on how to find it. true information amidst the increasing disinformation that's out there and so forth. Uh, that's sort of the mixed thing. So for the puppy, we say thanks be to God uh, and for the difficult navigation for all of us these days and seeing what is true. We say, oh God. Um, our son-in-law, Owen, is um, in North Carolina. He's a Red Cross uh, professional, and he's in charge of a lot of the stuff that's happening right now in North Carolina. And we pray for him. Um, and also, Sorry, it's been months since I haven't thanked you all with words for me. Um, I suffered um, breast cancer last year in July. I went through pretty much the whole year. Thank you, God, for His grace to me. Um, this July, I was suffering um, brain tumor. And um, next week, I'll be going in for radiation because I'm cremated part of the brain tumor. So I really appreciate your prayers. Um, all of you are so wonderful. <laughs> and um, Kurt and I have experienced great support from all of our friends. Um, many of the dinners that we've had have been celebrations uh, of our time together with all of you. And we just so appreciate that. So we love you all. Wow. We love you, Ruth. And we'll be thinking of you for the radiation treatment upcoming. And know you've walked such a great journey. Already, just pray that uh, you'll feel God's peace and healing in the days ahead. And we think of your son in law Owen as well. Give gratitude for the work he is doing. So, for Ruth, for Owen, we say, Oh God. Oh. 
I have two requests. Um, the first one is for our youngest grandson. Um, he was born premature um, last December, and he's really not catching up like he should, and just kind of refusing solids, and so he's starting OT this next week, and so we just um, pray for, for him. The other thing is to pray for Chrissy as she's traveling across the country with Vote Common Good, and we just I just want to pray for their safety. They're, I'm sure they get opposition at places that they are speaking through that. So those are my two requests. Thank you. Um, Ira. Ira. Well, prayers for Ira for healing, for the path forward, for good care. So for Ira and for Chrissy as she travels to the folks in Bocan Good, that they would speak truth and be safe. So for Ira and Christine and friends, we say, oh God. Amen. 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 Um, surgery on Tuesday. Um, probably won't be here for a couple weeks healing. But um, I do want to second that everybody here is just wonderful. Um, just seeing here for me and um, volunteering to make me meals and things like that. So, um, but I don't know, this part I get here is just amazing. And I don't know what I would do without this community. Um, I'm just so lucky, so blessed to have found um, UCC. It is, yeah, it's amazing. So, um, a hallelujah for finding UCC and just prayers for um, a healthy recovery. Absolutely. We'll be thinking of you this week, Sherry. Prayers for the procedure for healing for you. And yes, to celebrate uh, being able to be together during these difficult times. So for Sherry, we say, oh God, and our prayers and for the gift of community in these difficult times. We say thanks be to God. Amen. All right, friends, I'm going to cut it there, even though there may be more. There may be more, but people do have plans and the rest of the day, so I don't mean to cut anyone off. And I know there is more happening in our lives and in our world. And so for whatever else you may be holding on to, I invite you to lift that up now to God in the silence. Closing doxology, which we will sing as usual, a cappella. service, get a cup of coffee, a snack, get to know somebody new. A few things happening are on the back of your bulletin. A reminder that following worship, uh, a little bit after, we'll have book study 
and Potluck on Refugee of Faith. This Wednesday, speaking of, Bo Common Good will be in Holland for a rally, 5.30 at Centennial Park. I invite you to come uh, join that. And then I hear that afterwards we're celebrating somebody's turning 50. So <laughs> it's Christie's 50th on Wednesday. So you are welcome to join for a birthday party after. Um, and if you do plan to join and want to bring a food item or a beverage, please holler to Ellen. Uh, so that we can help plan. Alan's in the back row there waving his hand. <laughs> and thank you to Alan and Amy for hosting that. Uh, Thursday coffee, 9 o'clock, Holland Hospital Cafeteria, Friday meditation, 8 o'clock right here. Uh, next Sunday is our annual congregational meeting following worship. We would really encourage you uh, to join us for that. Uh, we are going to have a presentation on a new space opportunity that we are considering and are asking you to consider and vote on. And so it's helpful to have your voice there. We're going to look at the budget proposed for 2025 and vote and approve that, as well as new leadership team members, etc. There will be pizza, and uh, we'll have you home before whatever kickoff or care you are concerned about. And we would love for you to stay and join us. That's next Sunday following the worship. It'll also be our eighth anniversary. Wow. Which is pretty cool. Where does the time go? Um, the Wednesday following the election, we are opening space right here for folks to process what happened, what is happening. We may not know what has happened fully, but we just want to give folks a place to be together. So no agenda, just uh, show up uh, with open hearts. And if you want to bring something to drink or snack on, feel free to do that. That's 7 o'clock here at the Momentum Center. Any other announcements for the good of the hall I see in the back? I'm coordinating meals for Sherry, so if anyone is willing to do a meal, please come see me and I'll give you the details. Wonderful. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Sherry. If you want to get involved with Get Out the Vote, there are ways to do that. So you could talk to Sherry, you could ask a friend, and there are ample opportunities to be involved in this critical time. Yes, Jean. Uh, because I was distraught with tears, I forgot to say thank you to Christy and to Alicia for a fantastic women's retreat. Yes, I heard it was wonderful. Absolutely. And thank you for hosting me. Well, friends, you can always go online to hollanducc.org or follow us on social media for the latest happening with us. And now, as you go forth, may you go with eyes open to see the sacred in each moment, each place, and each person. And may the peace of Christ be with you today and always. Amen. 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 Go in peace. I'm going to go to the next one.